Hi, everybody. I'm Colleen Kickbush. I am a teacher of the visually impaired at Vision Forward Association in Milwaukee. Um, and I am also the Wisconsin Babies Count Coordinator. So I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about Babies Count. Um, and I'm going to share a link in the chat. Um, and if you can, go ahead and go to your chat. And um, we're going to do what's called a Jamboard. Um, and I'm actually going to screen share it as well. But in the Zoom, um, Oh, I have to stop sharing to get to my chat. Sorry, everybody. Um, I'm going to put a link in there. And if you don't mind, go ahead and click on that link. And what I want you to do is create a sticky note. And if you haven't, um, if you haven't created a sticky note using Jamboard before, um, it's on the left hand side, you'll be able to click an icon that is about halfway down the page that looks like a piece of paper with some writing on it. Um, and that's going to allow you to answer some of the questions that I have. Um, I just kind of wanted to get us started to see. There we go. Um, was everybody able to get into the Jamboard, first of all? All right, I think so. Um, so when you create a sticky note, I'm gonna have you guys type in the answers to a couple of questions. I just wanna get a little bit of a poll. Um, have you ever heard of Baby's Count? And if so, how did you hear about it? Um, and then number two is if you have, um, have you already completed a Baby's Count survey? And if so, with whom did you complete it? So if you're a provider, um, have you ever done a Baby's Count survey with any families yet? Um, or done any trainings with your um, staff? Good, we have one person who said they heard of Babies Count. And if you do create a sticky note, if you don't mind moving it um, to an open space on the board, if you can, if you do see it overlapping with another sticky note. Oh, someone else said yes, um, probably an email, okay? Um, and you haven't done anything yet, that's fine. I don't expect anybody to have any <laughs> prior, prior knowledge or there's no prerequisite class for today. Uh, this is gonna be an introduction. So I'm just looking, I'm happy to hear that you've heard about it. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you for, for answering that. Um, I'm gonna go back to sharing my PowerPoint um, and get back into this. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Vision Forward Association, I know I did mention we're in Milwaukee, um, but we work with people of all age who, ages who have um, any level of vision loss. And so I work mostly in the, um, with the birth to three programs around Milwaukee and the rest of the state. Um, but we do have a preschool program, a little classroom here at Vision Forward. Um, and we also have adult services. Um, and it's really nice because we even have a music therapist on staff and a full therapy team for children, um, which is really cool. And I do a lot of the home visits. Um, and like I mentioned, I am also the coordinator for Babies Count. Um, and that's what I want to show share with you today. Um, and you did say you had heard about it probably through an email, um, you know, or maybe just newsletters that you've seen around the state. But I just want to start by showing a video. Um, and this is actually from the Babies Count national webpage that I'll show you in a little while. Um, but it's just a little bit of an introduction to why this is important and why it's great that we're all learning about babies count. The face of blindness is changing. The face of blindness is older in every country, in every profession, traveling independently. Young, younger, in every grade, before any grade and brand new. Do we recognize it? The face of blindness is a preschooler learning to use a cane, a young boy solving a puzzle. Can you put a baby girl bonding with a stuffed toy? A little girl feeding herself for the first time. Primera vez que andamos 
sí mismo? I said is that the first time she said it by herself? <laughs> a toddler in a kitchen using a walker, walking and bouncing. A baby in a mother's arms. A little girl sliding down a slide, smiling triumphantly at the bottom. A young girl taking her first steps, holding hands with her mother and father. And a toddler crawling through a tunnel, standing up into the light. Are we ready? A new generation hopes we are. Babies count. So whenever I watch this video, which is, is often, um, you know, I just really like to chat with people to see what their favorite parts are. So think about that for a minute. Um, but I think the main takeaway from that video that we just really want to point out is there are a lot of resources out there um, for adults who are blind and visually impaired, but not always our children. Um, and even though there are resources available, I think families don't always know how to access them. And that's why it's so wonderful. And I want to thank Trish and Dave and WCB, WCBVI for putting on this conference, um, because I want all of the parents in our state to know what, and um, providers to know what are out there for our young children. We all do tend to think of, and if you can think back to before you worked with um, children in birth to three, um, or before you had a child who was blind or visually impaired, um, thinking back, you know, if you heard about somebody who was blind or visually impaired, what did you kind of imagine? Um, and I know a lot of times people tend to imagine adults, um, maybe walking with a white cane, um, you know, or reading braille. Um, and I don't know that there's a lot, you know, of exposure out there. Um, and our kids, they these adults start out as children who are visually impaired. Um, and I don't think everyone always thinks about them. So that's the point of Babies Count is really to make sure that the resources exist and the data that helps us understand better um, about our families and children with visual impairments. Um, and so that's why I thank you all for coming today. Um, and I just wanted to, to kind of get an idea. If you don't mind sharing, what are some of your favorite parts of that video? Okay, you can't be too shy. There's not too many of you. <laughs> I just want us to say, um, I loved seeing kids exploring. Yes. Oh, that I think, you know, and when you think about the different parts of the video, that is one of the main takeaways is they're all moving and exploring in whatever abilities they have. Um, and I think that's what what our, we're all in it for. We want our children to move and enjoy life um, and be able to do what makes them happy. Um, and I think one of my favorite parts is watching, there was that little girl who was kind of, you know, bobbing up and down and walking through her kitchen with a little um, adaptive mobility device, it almost looked like a little, a little handheld walker that someone had made for her. Um, and I think that's one of my favorites because it reminds me of one of my students. Um, but you know, that's, that's why we're all in this. We want to make sure that we're all having access to the same information um, and that we all understand what our children's needs are. Um, and I did, I want to check in the chat really quick. I do see, um, so oh, Trisha, you like the kids walking too, <laughs> me too. Um, oh, Maria, you love all parts. Oh, yes, just the exploring and yes, the making connections with um, their environments is is such a big piece. And that's why we all do this. That's what we want to get to. Um, and I also love in the video, there is a parent who, you know, she's watching her child basically feed herself with a spoon for the first time. And we all work so hard to get to that point. And, you know, it's really on the parents. They're the ones who, who do all this. Um, we're just here to support them. And so the best way we can do that is by making sure we are participating um, in Babies Count also and having this information available to us so that we can inform our programming for parents. Um, and so that's why I just wanted to explain a little bit about the basics of what Babies Count is. Um, it is a national registry for children who are under three, so three and under, um, that have eye conditions that impact their development. Um, so those children who are blind and visually impaired, 
um, as well as there isn't a medical criteria or anything. So these children don't have to be legally blind. Um, it's really any children who have the eye conditions that impact their development. Um, and so really, if there's somebody who would benefit usually from um, early intervention for vision needs, they are somebody who we would do the Babies Count Survey with them as providers. Um, and today, I really want families to understand um, and hear about Babies Count so that they know why it's so important to be participating in Babies Count. Um, because when everyone hears the word data, yes, it's a, a survey and a, a registry that collects data. Um, but it is really important. Um, and I'll talk about that on the next slide of some of the impacts. Um, but it is a survey that has about 37 questions and it's done with families. Um, a birth to three provider can do it um, or a teacher of a visually impaired, someone who's working with the family can do the survey with them at um, two times basically in their time in the birth to three program. Um, once at intake or we just started Babies Count in Wisconsin at the end of last year. So if the child's a little bit older right now, it's okay still to do um, the Babies Count survey. And then we do it again when the child is going to exit um, from the birth to three program. And that could be aging out um, or perhaps they're moving. Um, so then we would um, exit the survey. Okay, I do have a comment in the chat. Love seeing little ones using canes. Oh, I know, Dave. <laughs> I remember when it it just wasn't done. Yes, I know. And that's what is so wonderful. And you know, that's one of the main reasons I love Babies Count so much is it really, we just get to create awareness that there are children, you know, who are blind and visually impaired at this age. And even though it might seem like a low incidence area to other people, our children really benefit from early intervention, probably the most or just as much as other kids. So um, I will take you through a couple of things. Um, but I do want to let you know that there is a parent consent form um, that we use in Wisconsin. Um, at the national level, they don't necessarily require um, the parent consent form, but in Wisconsin, we do because even though the survey is anonymous, there still are children's birthdays on here um, and zip codes. And no one at the, at the state or national level would ever be able to tell who a child is. Um, from looking. There's just so much data. <laughs> I mean, I think the national one, the last data gathering had over 2,000 kids. So um, it's not like anybody could pinpoint who it is, but we just want parents to know that they're, what information about their child is on this registry um, and just who it has access to it. So basically, we know that people at Vision Forward Association, which is me, um, I get this spreadsheet with all the data for the state. But like I said, I would never know <laughs> who is who. Um, and so um, and then at the national level, it is the American Printing House for the Blind. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute also. Um, but I want to show you really quick what the parent consent form looks like um, so that you see it. Oops. Hold on, I'm going too far. Okay, it's not letting me show the parent consent form, but we'll take a look at the survey. Um, so as I mentioned, it's a national registry. And so it's completed a survey that's completed twice while families are in our program for early intervention. Um, and this is what the actual survey form looks like. And so it has, like I mentioned, 37 questions and it is divided into really four sections. Um, and the first couple sections, section pre-A and A, are just a little of basic information about the child. You know, are they male or female, their date of birth, um, and then there are some information, um, demographic information about the child and family. Um, so how much did the child weigh when they were born? And you might be wondering, okay, why does that matter? <laughs> well, um, a lot of children who are born prematurely um, end up um, some of them end up having retinopathy of prematurity or other eye conditions that are associated with their um, low birth weights. And so that's where that information ends up coming in later on. Um, so that's why it's important to us. We ask, um, you know, not only how much they weighed when they were born, but also were they full term um, or how many weeks were they when they were born? And the data actually, once it's compiled, we'll look at some of the data later. Um, but a lot of the children, um, who are visually impaired were born early. Um, and so that's where we just collect some demographic information and 
parents can always decline to answer some of these, but for us to have the most accurate data, um, it really does help for them to answer this. Um, and I will tell you a couple stories in a minute about some of this information and how it was used um, in research um, to learn things about visual impairments in the United States. Um, we do ask if, if families, this is the question that people skip the most, um, but if you do know the level of education that the parents have, um, that can really be a helpful helpful thing as well. Um, section B is the most important part of our baby's count survey, and that's the medical and visual information. And this can be gathered, um, and like I mentioned, a provider is usually sitting down with the parent to complete this. Um, so you can do this um, medical section based on medical records or parent report. Um, but we just ask that you choose um, one of those methods and mark it. Um, and so we really wanna know when was the child diagnosed with their visual impairment? Um, and you can also, there is a, um, an option that says diagnosis is suspected, but not yet officially diagnosed by a doctor. Um, and sometimes that does happen at this young age with little ones. Uh, maybe they're still doing genetic testing, um, still, you know, trying to figure out what exactly that is and pinpoint things. So um, you can also fill this out. Um, and that's what's nice is when we do the exit survey at the end um, of the child's time in birth to three, this is usually when we hope to have helped the family, you know, get to the right doctors, get to that diagnosis, um, as well as get to more resources. And so these questions all will come pre-filled when you go to do the exit survey. Um, so you don't have to refill them out, but you can go back and change anything. So maybe when you first did the entry survey, the diagnosis was suspected, but not yet officially diagnosed. And we would hope that that would change by the time they exit birth to three, that hopefully they have that diagnosed eye condition. And then we know um, better how to help that family going forward, especially if they're transitioning into the schools. Um, and then we do look at the different um, visual diagnoses they may have, and it gets pretty specific. It's in each eye, so we look at the right eye versus the left eye. And so we're going to look at not only what the primary eye condition is, so for example, maybe the child has a cortical visual impairment, or maybe they have optic nerve hypoplasia, or that retinopathy of prematurity, likely you would be marking that that's the primary condition in both eyes. And then you would also look at these, the, um, there's two columns that have additional um, visual impairments or conditions that you would check. And in, in, even though you can only have one primary eye condition, you can check as many as apply for the additional ones. And so a lot of our kids have nystagmus, um, maybe glaucoma, and some other conditions that accompany that primary eye condition. And so you can also mark that one. Um, strabismus is very common. That one's toward the bottom of the list a little bit because um, I believe they go in alphabetic order. Um, strabismus is a little bit further down, but those are those eye muscle imbalances. So if eyes are turning in or out, um, that is a more common secondary condition as well. And just like the section previously, you can also mark there are boxes to say unknown um, or and that they've been tested by a doctor or unknown and not yet examined by the doctor. Um, and then make sure if they have no additional diagnoses that you check the um, no additional diagnoses for the secondary condition if they only have one primary condition. Um, and the, le the other ones go through, we're going to talk about these a little bit more when we talk about the actual data that we get after these surveys are compiled. Um, but it does, a lot of states are interested in looking at visual impairments um, that are, and seeing if they're due to non-accidental trauma. Um, so that would include, you know, injuries from shaken baby syndrome um, and some of those other things that are non-accidental. Um, and sadly, um, this is one of those statistics that I wish I didn't know, um, is that so far from the data collection, there are actually 5% of all kids who are visually impaired, it's from a non-accidental trauma. Um, and that 5%, that's a pretty high number. Um, so, and some states are a lot higher, um, but that's why this data is helpful for us to know. And that's why in Wisconsin, it's gonna be important for us to take a look at it, um, you know, and to really see what these statistics look like for us um, and see how we can hopefully improve them in our state because obviously that's a number we would really want to bring down if it was that high. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how our statewide data comes back this year when we get our first statewide data collection. Um, and then we just look at do the, does the child need glasses or anything because of their visual impairment? Do they have other additional medical conditions or health conditions or delays? Um, and so there are options under there. Um, there is an other for medical conditions, but it looks to see if, um, you know, if children have 
neurological conditions, maybe um, autism, um, cerebral palsy, um, you know, other orthopedic impairments, deaf and hard of hearing, um, and just seeing what other needs our children have. Um, and from the data that's been gathered through the surveys, we do know that um, many, many, many of our children, um, about I think at least 70% of them have additional delays or medical conditions. So those are things that, that really help us to inform our programming um, and just be able to support families the best that we can. Um, and then the last section of um, that we would do at intake, which is part C, is their early intervention service information. So, you know, this just asks, you know, where do they live? Are they part of our birth to three program in the state? And if so, do they receive specialized vision services um, or do they just receive other services through the early intervention program? And if so, who provides their services? Um, and how often are those services? So, um, some people, it might be no ongoing specialized vision services. Otherwise, it might be maybe the child does have a, a licensed teacher of the visually impaired on their team or a certified orientation mobility specialist. So you can select all that apply. Um, and then just if they do, how, um, what frequency. And maybe it's that they needed a one-time evaluation to support the team um, and have consultation with the teacher of the visually impaired. Um, other times, maybe they need, you know, an as-needed consultation through our, especially if they're in the PCAP model where they have one primary provider. Um, so maybe the teacher of the visually impaired is um, providing support to that, um, you know, maybe the ed person or a physical therapist, whatever the primary needs of the child is. Um, otherwise, maybe they need direct service and it's once a month or once a week. Um, so whatever that is, we that's helpful for us to know what kinds of services we're providing for kids in our state so that we can improve those. Um, and just where are they taking place? A lot of our services in Wisconsin happen in the home or the natural environment, which is wonderful. Um, but if they do happen to go, you know, to a daycare or to another facility, um, we can mark that on here as well. And then the last section, section D, is only done on exit. Um, and there are only three questions. We just ask, um, you know, the date that they're exiting and then why. Is it that they're aging out, they're turning three years old? Um, and then if so, do you know where they're moving to? Um, what types of programming would be coming up next? Um, and as I mentioned, this survey for Babies Count is um, electronic. So everything will pre-fill when we go to do the exit survey. Um, and you won't have to go over all those questions and answer them all again. You just on the exit do these three additional questions, but be sure to look over the other sections from before if their diagnoses changed. Um, maybe they didn't have glasses when they were baby and, you know, just one year old. Maybe now they're a toddler, they're almost three and they do have glasses. Um, so that might be something that changes. So just making sure that we're updating as needed. So this is the important part. <laughs> You're probably wondering right about now, why should I care about babies count um, as a parent or as a provider of children who are visually impaired? Um, I will say families that I work with um, that have already completed the survey with me, they appreciated just having a role in helping other families um, in the state and in the nation, because this is a national registry. Um, and, you know, it might not necessarily be that they think they're helping now, but maybe in the future. Um, and I think part of it is also just knowing that you're not alone and that there are all of these other children who have um, and families who have children with visual impairments in, in our state. And we're also just really creating awareness with this um, and just making sure we know what types of services our children are getting and need. Um, and I do wanna share a little bit back to how I mentioned about the non-accidental traumas. Um, just a little bit of a story that, that I heard recently. Um, somebody who is the state lead from New Mexico actually shared this. Um, and she said back in 1995, when Babies Count started, um, they were one of the first states that started participating in the United States. And their, not, their rate of non-accidental trauma or the shaken baby or other non-accidental um, injuries that cause visual impairment was at 10%. So 10% of their children who were visually impaired was from non-accidental trauma. And they looked at that and said, okay, we have to bring that down. That is a very, very high percentage. Um, and this is something that we should be able to help families avoid. 
Um, and so they actually ended up creating a community awareness campaign and eventually went to share um, information and data from Babies Count with the legislature. And now there is actually a program in their state where parents have to watch a video about strategies to handle different emotions that come with having newborns or babies um, and help, you know, with some strategies and other things that help them avoid um, situations that could lead to a non-accidental trauma. And I know watching a video seems like such a small thing, um, but because of the data from Babies Count that they were able to start, you know, getting, having evidence and starting getting this program, they're able to look now. Um, and now this last year, um, their rate they feel like is still high, um, but now it's down to about 6%. And so from 10% to 6%, that's a lot of babies that they potentially helped with this data um, to reduce the occurrence of non-accidental traumas. And so that's the power that data can really have. Um, so, you know, thinking about, yeah, it takes about 10 or 15 minutes to do the babies count survey, but you really taking that spot 10 to 15 minutes um, a 10 to 15 minute survey can change lives um, of children who are visually impaired now and in the future. And so just please remember that as we go through some of this. Um, but really, we just need data in this area. Um, you know, blindness and visual impairment isn't the biggest field. Um, and we just need more information. It's not researched very often. Um, and so this is just really helps to create awareness that our kids are out there. Um, that we can't ignore their needs until they enter school at three or five. Um, and this data really does get used a lot to educate legislat legislators in our state as well as others um, and start systems change. Um, and Babies Count has also been used in other states to acquire funding. Um, and so these are things that can really support our children with visual impairments. Um, and we need this, we need this data. Um, so I'm happy that this is, we're going to our second year of data collection and participating. Um, and I'm so happy our state is a part of this now. Um, we just also all deserve to be connected throughout the year. Um, and I love that Trisha has this um, conference every year for us, but Babies Count is just another way that we can really enhance our connection to each other. Um, you know, getting families and agencies and providers together to collaborate um, and access these resources and really share knowledge across. Um, and it's all to benefit our children and families. And it's important to me and I appreciate you all for being here. I can tell it's important to you as well. Um, and as I mentioned, Babies Count is, um, you know, we can use this data to inform our programming, but it also initiates research. Um, and this is in the medical and the educational field. Um, and we also see more collaboration across these systems, too, when we use Babies Count. Um, but I wanted to share a little bit of um, what, what the initiates research and why this is important. Um, and Trisha, I know you know a lot about children with optic nerve hypoplasia. Um, and so feel free to add some additional information to this piece. But I just wanted to share that um, one of the main pieces of data that we'll look at in a minute is Babies Count is able to tell out of all the children, you know, that do the survey that are visually impaired in the United States, we're able to see what the most prevalent or most common eye conditions are. Um, and that's really important for us to know so that we can match families and providers with the proper resources, um, you know, to learn about that visual impairment, how it might impact their, their overall development, how they might start moving and exploring their space. Um, and some of the most important research that has happened over the past, um, I would say decade or two, um, after Babies Count data came out, um, different people have used it. Um, and in the educational field, a couple of people were able to look, um, one of them is Hatton, Deborah Hatton. Um, she is one of, she was able to, to look at this data um, and say, you know what? A lot of these kids, optic nerve hypoplasia, the prevalence has been increasing. Um, and a lot of the children who are having this have children, um, or sorry, have mothers that have a low um, age when the child is, is born. So really young mothers, and especially if it was their first child. Um, and that's just what they looked at. And that's why some of those numbers are important. You're probably wondering, you know, why do we need to know how old a parent is when their child is born and some of that. Um, but sometimes there are factors that are related to visual impairments that we might not even know yet. Um, and I think some of they also did look a lot at the relationships between medical advances um, and you know, occurrences of retinopathy of prematurity. So as children um, and medical things were advancing, children were living um, who were born a lot more prematurely than in the past. And so we saw more children with retinopathy of prematurity for a while, 
But then recently in the last few years, that um, number of children with retinopathy and prematurity has also been decreasing again um, and trending downward, which is great. And that's because of the care um, in the NICUs has been improving in some of, in some of the medical. Um, and what I also wanted to mention, I forgot about optic nerve hypoplasia. Um, that is Dr. Mark Borcher um, researched hotspots um, or areas using the zip codes from Babies Count um, to see where there were hotspots in the United States um, for this optic nerve hypoplasia um, and really looking if there were certain areas that had a higher prevalence and starting to look at maybe why that is. Um, and so I thought that was really interesting. And so far, no one has used the data to look at urban versus rural. Um, but I thought that might be an interesting research project someday. Um, we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, Trish, did you have anything to add about the optic nerve hypoplasia? Because I know you know so much about that. Um, and you I are a little more say I know so you. much. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I do know that originally they um, pinpointed it down to medication um, from pain pillars um, with like one parent had gotten in an accident um, and had to have pain pills and her child she was it was in her second month that's where they pinned it down where it happens mm -hmm. um, is with the second month of development in euro so but then they've found uh, many children the mothers didn't have any kind of medication in that second month so that's probably when they started looking at areas uh, with the zip codes. Yep. Yeah. And I think, everyone find is out. Just, you know, there's not, this was one of the like conditions that wasn't as well known. It just became so prevalent over the past couple decades that I think they wanted to know more. So it was an area of you know, higher research, like you said, and we just, I think everyone is looking for answers sometimes. So if we can learn anything through this data, um, factors that are associated with different visual impairments, it, it can just help. Um, are there any questions so far? Um, this is easy for me to say why this is important to me. Um, but please feel free to share either talking or in the chat if you'd like. Um, and I do want to mention too that something we don't talk about often, um, but what's really important too is after a few years of us doing babies count in our state, we'll be able to kind of have a forecast for the Department of Public Instruction um, and the school districts and some of the CESAs that work with our kids. Um, and we'll be able to better tell um, them that in the next, you know, one, two, three years, um, that in that certain area or region of the state, there's going to be, you know, five more kids who are visually impaired entering, um, and maybe what some of the needs might be. Um, so not specifically, we don't go down to the zip codes like we were talking about, but just in a general area, you know, by groups of counties, um, CESAs usually take up a few different counties in a state. So, you know, dividing them up regionally, that's something we're going to be looking at. Um, and just so that, that's part of that educational field working together. So we can collaborate, um, DPI and the Department of Health Services that hosts um, birth to three, they can work better to make sure the kids are transitioning and getting the appropriate services they need from one um, program to the next. Okay, no one commented in the chat, so I'm gonna go on, but if you have um, anything, please share. Um, and this is, um, so this is one of the um, graphs that comes from when the data is compiled, and this comes off of the Babies Count webpage, and we're going to be going to that to visit all of the data in a second. Um, but I just wanted to talk a little bit. This is one of the ones that has been most helpful to me as a birth to three um, teacher of the visually impaired. And this is looking at children's primary eye condition. So keep in mind, this is from Babies Count, so it's only children um, from zero to three years old. Um, and so of all of the children in the United States that they surveyed, which this one um, was from about 2,000 children, I believe, 30% um, of the kids who were visually impaired were um, had cortical visual impairment. And if you're not familiar with that, that is a neurological visual impairment. And all of the other ones on the chart you'll, you'll notice are ocular or eye conditions. So the difference is when you have the neurological visual impairment, like a cerebral or cortical visual impairment, um, it really, the eyes could be normal um, or typically developing. Um, and there's only problems with the way the brain is processing what we should be seeing with our eyes. 
Um, and that's the easiest way I can explain a complicated condition. Um, but basically there's 30% of kids. So that's the most prevalent um, eye condition that we see in the birth to three population. However, neurological is 30%, but all of these other conditions, if you combine them into ocular or eye conditions, make up 70%. So there's a couple different ways you can look at this graph. Um, that is one of them. The other way is just looking at the most prevalent is CVI. The next two most prevalent eye conditions are optic nerve hypoplasia and retinopathy of prematurity. And so we see a lot of children and it'll be interesting to see our state's data, um, but I would think it would probably be pretty similar to this. Um, just looking and thinking about my caseload, I would say that probably 30% of my kids have a cortical visual impairment, maybe more. Um, and so I think that's something that'll be really interesting to look at in our state and see. Um, and it helps me as the Babies Count Coordinator, the more data we have and the more information we have, especially on this chart, like which children or um, which eye conditions are prevalent in our state, I'll be able to better match families and providers with the resources they need in the different um, counties in the state. Um, right now, there are a lot of resources available for optic nerve hypoplasia and retinopathy of prematurity and CVI. And so those are the ones generally that we put on our Vision Forward webpage. Um, and I know Tricia has a lot at WCBVI on those conditions as well. So you can always reach out if you need some more. Um, but these other conditions, you know, maybe there's something in our state that sticks out a little bit more. Um, and just so you know, structural, um, if you're thinking about, well, what, is, what does structural mean? Um, those are eye conditions um, such as microophthalmia, where maybe there's a smaller eye, um, you know, or st structural, or structural things, um, abnormal, abnormalities with the eyes. Um, albinism is also one that is on here. 3.6% um, of the children in the nation who were under three who were surveyed had albinism as well um, and had low vision. And then you'll also notice on the right hand side, there are, um, there is pretty high percentage, 11.5% of kids. It was unknown at this point in their life. Um, and obviously there are many reasons it can be difficult to diagnose um, young children with visual impairments, um, especially if they're nonverbal or have multiple disabilities. Um, but it is, you know, kind of theorized that some of those children could be ones that maybe fit into that CVI category um, or the neurological visual impairments. Um, it just hasn't really been diagnosed yet. Um, and like I said, that's something we hope to help them with as they get um, closer to aging out of our programs. And then when we do the exit survey, maybe we'll be able to change it from unknown to one of the other conditions. I'm super excited, guys. We get to look at all of the data. Um, <laughs> and this is the part that I get a little like nerdy and, you know, some of the people who put this data together, they say they like geek out on it. Um, yeah, I do too. It's terrible. Um, and I could look at this all day. But one of the things I wanted to let you know is that at the national level, I'll just remind you that um, the American Printing House for the Blind are, is the agency that um, hosts the online platform now for this registry um, and the survey. And um, just make sure that each state has, you know, starts compiling their data. And I think this, um, they're, the data that we'll look at on the Babies Count website is from 2020, and there were um, 10 states that were participating, um, where the 2021 pre preliminary results from last year just came out, and they haven't been officially released on the website, but we can take a look, look at that as well. Um, and then, and since we are one of the new states, ours was also added into that. And so now instead of 10, it's about 15 states um, just within that one year who had joined. So each year, it's increasing and we're getting more and more children in states to participate, um, which is wonderful. Um, and then just to let you know, it kind of is like a three tier process. So under the national level um, is our at our state level. Um, I am the Wisconsin Babies Count Coordinator and I work at Vision Forward. And so I work a lot with the people at the national level. I go to um, meetings about four or five times a year with the national leads um, to learn about the new data that's coming out, next steps, um, how we interpret the data, how we can start sharing it out in our states with other interested parties like different agencies. Um, and then that's where I also work on training people. Um, this past year, we did a lot of training um, in Wisconsin just to get this program up and running. And we did actually meet our program goals for the number of um, surveys that we needed to start getting enough data so that we could participate in the national data gathering. Um, so I was proud that we, we did that, but this year that's our focus is now that everybody or a lot of people are trained in our state, we should be able to start 
you know, making sure that we have almost all the families entered in here, which is wonderful. Um, and so this year, if you have questions or haven't had the trainings, please contact me. Um, and because I really do work with the county birth to three programs too, to make sure that all the families get registered and um, are receiving the resources that are associated with this. Um, so now I just want to take a look and explore the website a little bit. Um, and so if you go to babiescount.org, um, this is the information and homepage you will see. That video we watched earlier is also on this website um, if you scroll down. Um, and then there also is just the overall story and the history. I didn't share a ton about the history of Babies Count, um, but you can read more about that if you're interested. I did mention it did start in 1995, um, but this last year um, in 2021 was the first year that Wisconsin participated. And if you are wondering what states um, are participating, you can scroll all the way down to the bottom of their web page, and there is a banner toward the bottom that has all of the participating states. Um, and you'll notice there are quite a few. And there's more than the 15 that I talked about um, that are in the survey. And if you're wondering, there are lots of reasons why that might be um, that there are more states. Um, some of them enrolled after the data deadline. Um, and there are also some states that because of other um, you know, issues or things that came up last year, they just weren't able to gather as much data as they would have liked. But luckily, Wisconsin, we were added last year um, and we did have enough data. So we are in the results from this year. Um, and of course, there's lots of pictures of our adorable friends. Um, there. But if you want to know more about the data, this is where you can actually download an entire PDF to look at all the data charts. Um, the one that I have up on the screen right now is the chart that was in the PowerPoint about the primary eye condition. So going across from um, left to right, we have CVI, optic nerve hypoplasia, ROP for retinopathy of prematurity, um, albinism, the structural abnormalities, retinal conditions, um, other, just so you know, other category has lots of conditions in there, but that's um, the, um, the strabismus, the nystagmus, um, some of the other conditions that had um, lower numbers were kind of grouped together just for the, ch the visual chart purposes, um, but that data is split out in some of the new charts that we'll look at if you want additional information. Um, and then some of the ones that we talked about earlier were also the non-accidental trauma. So they give you a little bit of a visualization here. Um, it's a, this one's a pie graph. Um, and as I mentioned, 5% of visual impairments were caused from a non-accidental trauma. And so that's a number I think um, some states are higher than that 5%. That's the average um, in the nation. Um, and as I mentioned, the sample for this was over 2,000 children, so 2,110 children. Um, and these results were from 2020. Um, the new ones, the preliminary ones from last year did come out, but they haven't been released yet. Um, and I do have access to it to show you guys today, uh, but they will be changing these results over to um, the 2021 results very soon. Um, and so in this one from 2020, there were 10 states. Um, and you can see, not all the ones on that banner at the bottom are on there, but these are 10 states that participated. And then Wisconsin was added to this year, which is nice. Um, a lot of our children, I want to touch on a couple other. Um, a lot of our children do have other medical conditions that are concurrent with their visual impairment. And the most prevalent is neurological. Um, and I just want to go through and like let you know what a couple of what neurological that includes any of the following conditions. That would be um, autism spectrum disorder, cerebral palsy or orthopedic impairment, um, seizures, uh, congenital brain disorders, um, acquired brain disorder, spina bifida. Um, those are the ones that are included in that category. And so as you can tell, a lot of our children do have concurrent medical conditions. Um, and some of the other more prevalent ones were feeding difficulties. Um, which I think is very interesting, and I'm sure it's for a, a variety of reasons. Um, it can be the textures and the <laughs> tactual defensiveness and sensory issues, but um, it can be other things like maybe they have GI issues and um, other, other things. Um, and so that's another piece of data that we're able to use those questions on the survey to put them together. Um, and in our state, one of the things, and each state looks at something different. Like I mentioned, a lot of states are really interested in lowering their not their the non-accidental trauma number. Um, our state is also very, very interested in looking at 
when children are diagnosed with their visual impairment and how long it takes them to actually start getting early intervention services um, or specialized vision services. And so in 2020 with this data, on average, um, children with cortical visual impairment or CVI were not diagnosed until over 10 months old. Um, and some obviously are much, much older. And then they weren't getting vision services until they were a year old. Um, and that's very troublesome. Um, and I know in our state, I will be really interested in this information because cortical visual impairment is one of the only visual impairments that we can actually improve visual functioning over time with very, very regimented um, interventions from a teacher of the visually impaired, um, as well as other early interventionists. And that's something that I would love to get our children um, you know, obviously we want to get them diagnosed earlier, but we also want to be able to help help them and get them vision services quicker. Um, so that's um, CVI, and I think, um, oh, what was the other one? Um, sorry, let me check my notes. Um, oh, CVI and retinal disorders were the ones that were diagnosed um, later than other conditions. Um, and then the ones that are diagnosed the earliest are children who have um, the structural abnormalities or the retinopathy of prematurity, because that's usually discovered when children are first born and in the hospital. Um, and obviously it's harder to see the back of the eye or the retina when children are, are really little babies that hardly keep their eyes open. Um, so that's why those doctors checking vision is, is super important. Um, and Can I say something? Yeah, okay. go ahead. This is Trisha. Um, the one thing about the cortical vision impairment, why it doesn't get diagnosed until much later, a lot of times is because the um, there's a lot of other health areas that are more concerning just to keep them alive because they're saving so many babies, but there's multiple things happening um, throughout the body when they're saving them so early. Um, I have a feeling that's probably why they're not looking at the vision because they're looking at the full health of the baby and yeah. keeping them alive at the beginning. Yes, but I also feel like it, we have to create awareness with this to let people know that it is really important to diagnose these kids earlier and get them services earlier because as we know their vision can impact all areas of development too so oh, obviously absolutely. they need to get those medical needs met and stuff but we do that is an area i think we could create a little more awareness um and i think when providers you know and trisha this is this is part of what you and i do for our job is making sure yeah. that we're going out and presenting to birth to three providers and things and making sure they understand more about cortical visual impairment and other conditions so that they know what, you know, characteristics and behaviors and things to look at. Um, and, you know, we're also working in our state to improve some of the screening for little ones. And I think that that's something that is just going to help a lot too. So hopefully we can improve some of those numbers over time and just help um, the families. And Absolutely. Hopefully, Absolutely. You know, hopefully it'll help their overall development. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's lots of things they look um, at with babies count data, and they can put a lot of those questions that we saw. It's 37 questions, but they can be compiled to tell us a lot of information about kids. Um, and I know we started a little late today, but I want to get back to a couple of other things. Um, but looking at what types of services children get um, it can be really, really important. Um, and so that's something in our state we'll be looking at as well. So let me go back to... Um, and I just really quickly want to show you the preliminary results that came out. Um, and this is actually a document that is available through the American Printing House for the Blind. Um, it's on their um, Access Academy webinars site right now. They just did um, a fabulous Babies Count webinar um, this um, earlier this month um, at the national level about this new data and about Babies Count. And there is a video um, that they share on the website um, publicly that is about an hour long. Um, I really do encourage you to check it out. Um, and they start to go over some of this new data um, as well as compare it to that 2020 data we were just looking at on the website. Um, and this doesn't, it's preliminary, so it's just a chart or a table. It doesn't have um, any of the um, like visualizations or graphs or anything yet. Um, and this is the information they will be making into visualizations and putting on the website. You just have to stay tuned. Um, they're just finishing up last year's data gathering. Um, but you'll see a lot of the percentages end up being the same across years. So um, the first, sorry, let me look at this. So in 2020, that data we had just looked at, about 30% of kids had a cortical visual impairment. 
or delayed visual maturation, where in 2021, it was about 31.4% of kids. Um, and so most of our percentages are staying pretty similar from year to year with babies count, which is really good and just shows, um, you know, that this is pretty accurate data um, across the years. Um, optic nerve hypoplasia, they did show a slight decrease from 9.3% to 8.1%. Um, and one thing that I was a little interested um, was from 2020 to 21, um, the instances of ROP went down quite significantly. So it went from 9.3% of all children who were visually impaired that were surveyed to 6.1%. Um, and so that's a pretty significant drop. And so I would be interested to know, you know, why do we think that that happened? Um, so that's just some interesting things to kind of think about. Um, oh, look, non-accidental trauma went down from 5% to 3.6%, which that sounds great. And, you know, I'm always interested to know how COVID impacts our families. And I'm wondering, <laughs> And some of these are impacted by, by COVID, but it's interesting to think about some of these things. Um, and it does break them down into these concurrent medical conditions. So if you go to this chart, um, you'll all have access through the live binder to the PowerPoint. So feel free to check out and you can see each of like, what is global syndrome when they list that? That's any chromosomal disorders or hereditary disorders. Um, and so you can see how they kind of look at these categories separately. Um, and then I also like to look at that other category and see all the breakdown of conditions that fall under that. So that included kids who maybe were born with addiction, um, heart disease, respiratory problems, um, GERD, um, and some of these other issues. So those are all kind of compiled into that other category. So um, hopefully you'll find some of this data interesting. Um, and then I just want to make sure you know, other than that babiescount.org site at the national level, all of the data for our state um, will be housed on the Vision Forward website. And if you go to Vision, Forward web, Vision Forward's website, there's actually two pages that I think would be of interest to any families um, or providers of children who are young. Um, there's an infants and toddlers page as well as a specific babies count page. Um, so when you're on the babies count page, that's a lot of the information that I share with providers and agencies when I go out. Um, and so I have some resources compiled here, like all the data from the previous um, 2017 results and the 2020 results, um, as well as some handouts for agencies that they can use. Um, there's a babies count like announcement. So sometimes you can use that to help families um, learn a little bit more. There are also instructions for how you log into that babiescount.org website if you're an agency lead or a provider who needs to do the survey online. Um, and if, as I mentioned, if you have not had the training um, or the county you work for has not had the Babies Count training from me yet, please reach out. Um, I'll show you my contact information. Um, but these are all things that I will train your staff how to do. Um, and there's also provider instructions and videos and things on here. Um, and then my favorite page also is just the infants and toddlers pages, especially for our families. Um, this is where a lot of our resources are going to be housed. Um, so it, they're not necessarily associated always with babies count, but they kind of go hand in hand because they're for infants and toddlers. Um, and so there's a vision development piece on here. They, I think they called it parent education piece, but that's about vision development in infants and toddlers, um, as well as a page that suggests just how to help your child keep their glasses on, because I think we've all had, <laughs> had trouble with that. Um, and then I've also just made some other handouts um, about CBI and some other conditions. And then some some activities that are fun, like creating a song box to do with your family or a song bag. Um, and if you don't know what that is, check it out. Um, and a lot of our handouts are also in Spanish, and then some of them are in Hmong as well, in case you have families who um, have a different native language. So I just wanted to make sure you knew where to find your information when you're looking for it, um, and you can get that in the PowerPoint. And I will finish up because now I'm keeping you over. Um, we got started a little late, so hopefully it's okay. Um, lastly, I just wanted to share some of our updates just for, for Wisconsin. So as I mentioned, Babies Count really is a national registry. So it's for, you know, the entire United States, um, children under three who are visually impaired. But in our state, we just started last year, um, but 
just last year, I was able to, as a coordinator contact, um, I have had contact with all, um, like with 63 out of the 72 counties in Wisconsin. So 88% of the counties I've already been in discussions with. Um, and I've already trained about 44 of the 72. So just over 60%, which I think is actually really good pro progress. Um, Cause I mean, Trish, remind me if I'm wrong on this, but I think I started training people like in April last year. Um, so it wasn't even like a full full year yet. Um, and so the amazing part and what really melts my heart is that I could care less about how many people I've trained, but the fact that we already have over 60 surveys in our state system um, is amazing to me. Like last year, my goal was just to train agencies and kind of get everyone up and running. Um, but amazingly, we already have over 60. And I'm just really happy and proud of everyone. And it just shows how well everyone has been collaborating. Um, I can't do this without Trisha and people from WCBVI, as well as all of the people that I've worked with across um, the counties in birth to three um, and the state birth to three as well. And so that's something that Vision Forward and I are just really extremely excited to, to collaborate with everybody. Um, and as I mentioned, we should be getting our first statewide data analysis. So we saw that preliminary data for the nation come out, um, but they do, they're gonna sit down with me and I get to look through the data with them for our state um, and kind of pick out things like we mentioned, I wanna look at um, you know, data, um, age of diagnosis versus when they're getting services and some of those things um, and see what areas our state can improve um, and help improve our services for families. And that should be coming out um, later this year, hopefully. Um, so thank you all for joining me today. I really, really appreciate it. Um, again, in the chat, if you um, don't mind going to that Jamboard, um, I have a link, um, a second page on there I'm going to be sharing that has um, a question. It's a second document that has questions and answers. So um, feel free to ask me, stick around. If you have time, you can ask me in person, but if not, um, please go to the Jamboard and I will be sure to answer those questions. Um, and really, if you just have any comments as well, um, let me share the Jamboard again in the chat. All right, there's the link. Holly, I have a question for you. Yes. Will, when you get the state data, will mm -hmm. you be putting it up on um, the Vision Forward website yes. or anywhere? Yep. Okay. yep, so that Vision Forward website that I just showed you that is the Babies Count specific page, that's where the data will be um, housed on there. Okay. And I will also be, um, that's something else we're going to be setting up once we start to get data. Um, we're actually going to be having probably, I don't know if it's going to be a once a year, like an annual state week, um, county leads meeting. Um, and that's something that any providers who are interested could attend, but it'll be for those agency leads that um, have the account with Babies Count and are putting in the surveys and some of that. Um, and they're, they'll get, if they're interested in coming to that, we're going to have a meeting about the data and how um, it can be interpreted or used to inform the programming for that, for our state um, birth to three program so that we can really use this data to help us um, improve our services for kids the best we can. Awesome. Thank you, Colleen. Yes.